This Filmmaker IQ lesson is proudly sponsored by Rode Microphones, premium microphones and audio accessories for studio, live, and location recording. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and today we're going to dive into the science and engineering of sound and microphones. As vision is our brain's response to electromagnetic radiation in the form of light waves, sound is our brain's response to atmospheric pressure changes. Well, we're not exactly walking weather barometers, but the concept is the same. Now let's imagine a tightly wound string, that of a guitar. When the string is plucked, the string vibrates, pushing the air molecules around it. This push is called compression, and it creates a peak of high air pressure. Now as the string retracts, we have rarefaction, a trough of low air pressure. Now this repetition of compression and rarefaction creates what's called longitudinal waves or compression waves. That's a wave where molecules are moving in the same direction as the wave itself. Now it's worth noting that the molecules pretty much stay in one place. It's the energy that is moving through the air at the speed of sound. Now, if we plot the changes in air pressure created by the sound wave against time, we get a waveform. Through waveforms, we can visualize some key aspects about sound. The first is amplitude. Now, amplitude is the strength of the wave itself. The greater the distance from the center line, the more intense the wave. A common method of describing amplitude is something called RMS, root mean square, which is a mathematical handy, mathematically handy way of determining the average amplitude of a wave. Well, then there's frequency, the rate of how many cycles of peaks and troughs are in a given period of time. Now this is most commonly measured in hertz, or cycles per second. One hertz is one cycle per second. As we go up in the number of hertz, we perceive a rising in pitch. 440 hertz is the standard that musicians use to tune their instruments, which corresponds to an A on the second space treble clef. Now, since a sound wave cycle can begin at any point in the waveform, we have to consider phase when we record sound. At what point do we pick up the sound wave? Now this isn't an issue when dealing with a single wave, but when you combine waves together, when using stereo microphones or stereo speakers, waves that are in opposite phase will add together and cancel each other out, which is not something we want when we record sound. Now as we move into more complex waveforms, we start dealing with harmonic content, and this is what makes music and voice so wonderful. Let's go back to our string example. Let's say this string vibrates at 440 hertz, an A, but it's also vibrating at higher frequencies. The most basic are whole number multiples of the fundamental frequency, such as two, which gives us 880 hertz. This is a whole octave above the fundamental frequency. It's also vibrating at a third multiple for 1320 hertz, which is an octave and a fifth, an E, and so up, uh, up on the multiples of the fundamental frequency. Now, some of these frequencies resonate louder than others, and there are some oddball frequencies thrown in there as well, but all this is happening every single time that string gets plucked. These extra frequencies are called harmonics, and though these harmonics aren't as loud as the fundamental frequency, they shape and color the sound, making it possible to distinguish between two different instruments playing the same pitch, say a French horn and a trumpet. The final aspect of the waveform we need to examine is the envelope. The envelope describes the shape of a sound over time, which starts with an attack. That's the time it takes for a sound to build up to full volume. Then there's the decay, how quickly the sound levels off to a sustain after the initial attack. Then there's the sustain, the ongoing sound, and then finally the release, how quickly a sound dissipates after the note is released. 
Now that we have a basic grasp of what sound is and how to describe it in terms of frequency, phase, harmonic content, and envelope, let's go back and look at amplitude or loudness. How do we measure the strength of sound? The human ear has quite an amazing ability to detect sound waves, capable of an energy range of approximately 10 to the 13th power to one. With such an enormous range, we have to use a logarithmic scale in order to define loudness when working with audio. Now, fortunately, our ears respond to sound in a logarithmic fashion. Now, basically, a logarithm of a number is the exponent to which another fixed value, the base, must be raised to produce that number. So say we want the log of 10 using base 10. Now, 10 to the first power is 10, so the log of 10 is 1. The log of 100 is 2 because 10 to the second power is 100. The log of 1000 is 3 because 10 to the third power is 1000 and so on. Logs make working with exponential scales easier, which is why they're so useful in this discussion. But let's not get too hung up on the math. The unit used to describe sound loudness is the decibel. Originally implemented by Bell Laboratories to describe signal loss in telephone lines, the decibel, which was formally introduced in 1928, describes the relationship between two different signals as 20 times log of the signal strength using root mean squared divided by a reference signal strength using root mean squared. Now, right off the bat, the decibel is not a measurable unit like a centimeter or a centigrade or a gram. It's a comparison, and you always need a reference. For determining loudness of sound pressure, we can use the quietest sound that can be detected by the average human being as our reference. This number has been internationally agreed upon as 20 times 10 to the negative six pascals, or 20 micro pascals. Now, we can compare the sound pressure of noisy things to this bare minimum, and we can derive a decibel chart from a soft whisper at around 30 decibels SPL to a freight train at 100 feet, which is 70 decibels SPL, to a, a jet takeoff at 200 feet, registering at 120 decibels SPL. Now notice the distance is always notated as sound waves dissipate according to the inverse square law. Now safety regulations have risen around these decibel ratings, 85 decibels and below, and you'll be fine for in that noisy situation for up to eight hours. Cut that time in half each five decibels. You go up. But sound pressure level is only one kind of decibel. For filmmakers, we are more likely to encounter decibels in regards to the power of an audio signal when carried through an audio system. Here the equation is slightly different. A dBm is 10 log P over P ref, where P is measured in wattage and the reference is one milliwatt. <laughs> it's really easy to get lost in the science and the math, but the dBm is the most common expression used in audio equipment and audio workstations. There are a few basic concepts that are relatively easy to grasp. Turning up something by 3 dB will double the signal strength. But because our ears are so logarithmically sensitive, doubling the strength doesn't mean we double the loudness. Consequently, turning down something 3 dB halves the signal strength, which is also not as significant as you might think. And because we are using log, turning something up by 10 dB means we're actually increasing the signal 10 times. 20 dB, and we're increasing signal 100 times. 30 dB boost means the signal is being boosted a thousand times. Now, does this math matter to the working professional? Probably not. But as you work in audio, you will start to intuitively know what a boost of 3 dB sounds like or 6 dB. Just know that there is a tremendous amount of science, math, and engineering behind all of this audio wizardry. Okay, so how do we capture sound waves and turn them into electrical current, which we can then use to record? Well, there are several different ways of capturing sound, but we'll cover the most common ways of recording. The simplest is the dynamic microphone. In a dynamic microphone, a thin diaphragm is connected to a coil of wire called a voice coil, which is precisely suspended over a powerful magnet. 
As the sound waves strike the diaphragm, it causes it to vibrate, moving the voice coil through the magnetic field generated by the magnet, and it generates a small bit of electricity, which is sent down the output leads. This is our audio signal, an electrical representation of actual sound waves. Now the advantages to the simple and robust design of the dynamic microphone is that it can handle loud sources without much distortion. Now unfortunately this makes them weak when trying to capture soft distant sources because the diaphragm needs a lot of sound energy in order to move. A variation on the dynamic microphone is the ribbon microphone. Instead of using a coil, ribbon microphones use a small strand of very thin, two micron thick aluminum ribbon. This ribbon is much more responsive to the high frequencies with the drawback that the ribbon is fragile and prone to tearing. Now, ribbon microphones are almost exclusively used in the studio and not for location audio because of their fragility. The final type of microphone commonly used in film is the condenser microphone. Now condensers use two electrically charged plates, one fixed and one which can move acting like a diaphragm. Unlike dynamic mics, there is no coil. Instead of using electromagnetic principle, condenser microphones use the electrostatic principle. The two charged electric plates creates what's called a capacitor. As sound waves strike the electrically charged diaphragm, it moves in relation to the fixed plate, changing the capacitance and generating a very small electrical charge, which is then amplified inside the microphone and sent off to be recorded. Now the advantage of condenser microphones is their response. Because you're not moving a coil, condensers can be more responsive in the high frequencies. And because we don't have any magnets, Condenser microphones can be made very, very small. Now, because condensers work with electrically charged plates, that means they require some sort of outside electrical power. Now, some microphones have the option of an onboard battery, while all microphones, all condenser microphones, can utilize something called phantom power, which is a plus 48 volts from a audio recording machine or a mixing board. There's not one microphone that is perfectly suited for all applications. We've already covered three kinds of sound conversion technologies. Let's take a brief overview of the kinds of microphones that are used in film and video production. Of course, we're only going to scratch the surface of what's available. When choosing a microphone, we have to consider the directional response, which oftentimes is represented by something called a polar pattern. Now, there are a few common types of polar patterns. The omnidirectional pattern means the mic is responsive to sound from all directions. You don't have to be on axis in order to be picked up. These mics are useful for picking up sound in a general area, but the drawback is they will pick up all the unwanted sounds in a general area. An example of an omnidirectional mic is this Rode Reporter mic, which is designed for news interview applications. You don't have to point it directly at the source, you just have to get it close to the speaker. Now, directional mics are a bit more picky about what they can hear. The most basic is the cardioid pattern. Now, notice how it picks up what's in front of the microphone on axis and not what's behind it. An example is the Rode M1 mic, a dynamic microphone that is suited for live performance as it picks up sound on axis but won't pick up what's behind it, like crowd noise or feedback from a loudspeaker. The Rode NT55 is an example of a cardioid condenser microphone, which has the option of switching between cardioid and omnidirectional. The NT55 and other large diaphragm condenser mics like this beautiful sounding Rode NT1 are well suited for voiceover and other studio recording applications. Now more directional are the hypercardioid and supercardioid polar pickup patterns. The Rode NTG2 shotgun microphone is an example of a super cardioid mic which picks up the front and the sides and rejects 150 degrees to the rear. Now this condenser microphone used in conjunction with a boom pole is a great solution for recording location audio and trying to filter out some of that unwanted ambient sound. 
Now for working with even noisier situations, you may look into something like the super long Rode NTG8 microphone, which is great for noisy outdoor use. Now some condensers and ribbon microphones will feature a figure eight pickup pattern or a bi-directional pickup pattern. Mics like the Rode NT2000 can be switched into bi-directional pattern, which is useful for certain musical applications. Now there are two other kinds of microphones that will have a place in film and video production that we haven't talked about. The most common is the lavalier or lapel mic. Mics like the Rode lavalier and the really awesome sounding pin mic are small condenser microphones with an omnidirectional pickup pattern that are designed to be placed on the talent in order to capture sound. They work on proximity and when combined with a wireless transmitter and a receiver can offer the most freedom and flexibility when recording audio but because of their small size and the placement on the body of the talent, lavalier microphones just won't have that same richness of sound as a shotgun or a studio condenser mic. Now another useful type of mic is called the boundary mic. Now boundary mics are omnidirectional condenser mics that are positioned flush with a surface and capture sound as it rolls off that flat surface. Boundary mics are very useful when recording stage productions. So between handheld mics, shotgun mics, studio condensers, lavaliers, and boundary mics, these will be the microphones you will need for the vast majority of situations you will encounter when making films and video. Now remember, sound is a crucial part of the filmmaking process. In some cases, getting good, clean sound is actually more important than getting a decent picture. Now we've just scratched the surface of the science of sound and microphone technology, but now it's up to you to research and experiment with recording sound. Go out there, make something great. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.